2000 and 2001 season was a famous one for Liverpool Football Club. 63 games played and three trophies won. Gerard Houllier and his class of 2001 brought the good times back to Anfield 20 years ago. Two decades on from cementing his Liverpool legend, the iconic Houllier would sadly pass away, leaving his club and his team in mourning. As part of the 20-year anniversary of that memorable term for Liverpool, the Echo spoke to several members of Houllier's squad to talk through some of their greatest days on the football pitch and also to pay their respects to a manager they revered so much. This is the story of the 2001 season told by those who shaped it. I suppose the first place to start is a simple one, really. Can you believe it's been 20 years since since that season? No, no, I can't. I mean, I can, I can go back to that season so easily. So just, uh, as, the, as we always say, time flies when you're having fun. And uh, we certainly had fun uh, that season. And I think around that time as well was that, that was almost the rebirth of, of of Liverpool under a foreign manager, getting back into Europe again, doing well. And uh, it felt like every year there was there was an anniversary for one of the teams in the you know in the seventies, if you like, you know, twenty or twenty five year anniversary. And there was so much success at that era, and you know, you just you never picture yourself in those situations. Really, it seems so far away if you're lucky enough to be successful. So. Here we are, 20 years later, the same as it was for uh, maybe Tommy Smith and all those ex-players really, when they were winning everything in the 70s. It went so quickly, playing so many big games and having so much success. It kind of, a bit like your career really, it goes by in a flash. And I don't think when you're in it, you probably enjoy it and appreciate it and understand the enormity of it until later when... You know, you can look back with pride and actually realise what you did and what you were part of. As much as I know it's a while ago, you know, and, but where has that gone? Where has the 20 <laughs> years gone? It is, it is remarkable. You know, I've seen the boys several times, you know, over, the, over the, the piece of leaving the club and, you know, we've had a couple of little get-togethers as well and some golf days and when I was doing the bits, for, the ambassadorial bits with, the, with Liverpool, it was great to meet up with the guys that, that I played with and, you know, going to places all over the world and chatting about the treble. But to think it's 20 years ago is quite, it's, 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 that was like, wow, that's a long time ago. The, the League Cup, it was, I was just looking at the, the results a couple of hours ago. It was, a, it was a bit of a roller coaster, wasn't it, with the, the real battle against Chelsea going to extra time and then Hammer and Stoke 8 0 and then getting beat at Palace and then the cop reminding Clinton Morrison the score. I mean, what, what were your, your memories of, of that first run to, to Cardiff? Well, the run was, obviously, when it starts off, it's sort of low-key. You make changes. Um, not as many as seems to happen now. Um, but I do remember that Stoke game, um, more importantly. And I think it was just a little bit of a rocky time that we had things going our way. And I think we had Peggy Arfex said in goal um, for that. And I can remember at nil nil, they actually went through one on one. He slotted it past Peggy. The ball hit the post, and as Peggy turned round, the ball came into his arms. And I turned to Gerard, nothing like that, and I said, "That's the change of our look." Yeah. And lo and behold, the game. I think did Robbie get three or four? Yeah, they got a hat trick. Yeah. Robbie got a hat trick, and it was just. It was just like a uh, procession. We just played some really good stuff because Stoke were always up and it was, they wanted blood on the day and <laughs> every time we played them. And so it was always a, a hard place to go, as anybody will tell you. But we played fantastic and 8 0. And people would go, oh, they must have had a lot of changes. They probably did, but um, it was still a great scoreline. In the final itself, um, probably. Um, something of a theme across the season was you didn't make it easy for yourselves and your big favourites going into that game against Birmingham and, and what are your memories of, of that game in Cardiff? We were big favourites because they, they were a championship team we played really poorly on the day yeah, we really did and and maybe that was a problem with, with, with how we played in, in that team in that we were built to play against top teams and make it difficult for them when we were playing against teams we, you'd expect to really dominate 
maybe that was one of those occasions where we maybe could have been on the front foot and maybe a little bit more. It was a game where um, Robbie Fowler started, Michael Owens on the bench because Heskey was one of the first names on the team sheet mm. at that stage of the season. And Robbie scored a great goal. And we didn't really go on then and just kill the game off. I mean, and we didn't play particularly well. We were poor. In fact, we were lucky. What you would say is, you know, and this is not a criticism of loads of managers, you know, even today. But in the list of priorities, you know, the League Cup was is probably the one that that, 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 that that hits the bottom of the list. But that wasn't the case. You know, we were the club had gone quite a while without winning, so we we were we were all in. You know, and I think when you see the teams that that Gerard picked, you know, with a, it was you were coming into that part of the season, getting you know getting good runs where you're playing Saturday, Wednesday, but we were picking strong sides for all the games in, in that cup run. And it was very clear that we, we needed to go to the Millennium and win. We got to penalties and I just remember being really angry at the end of the game, really about how we performed as a team and the fact that it had gone to penalties really against a, you know, a championship club. So when I went up to take my own penalty, it was never a case of, I, I, was, I was angry. Really, and, and I, I didn't feel that nervous or that much pressure on me. Cara, Cara had a hundred metres run at it. I can remember him absolutely. He was like that, rattling up to it. And he's, he must have made his mind up where he was going to put it. And he just put his foot through the ball, side mm -hmm. foot, and it rattled in. It was just a long run up, head down and uh, pick me spots. Stuff it away. But your, uh, your dad missed it, didn't he? Yeah, I think when he seen me walking up, he, he, he got off. He done one. I don't know that he went right out the stadium or just went to the toilet <laughs> waiting for the row, if you like. But yeah, it's, I mean, I'd be the same watching me old lad. It's, it's, yeah. it's not easy. We're all nervous watching Liverpool when we're uh, watching them now as supporters or even back then. But when it's your own son involved, it just adds another layer to it. So yeah, he would have been What were the What were the celebrations like after the game? Because I know a little bit further on for the FA Cup, Gerard was very... Very against, you know, overly celebrating. But uh, how was it to get get the first one? It was it was a big no, night. For we, I, I, off the top of my head, I can't remember what the following game was. Um, but there was no great celebrations. You know, there was no, there was there was there was a few drinks and a bit of dinner back at the hotel with with friends and families. But nothing nothing over the top. You know, I think he's 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 thinking would be that there's greater things to come, and he and he was probably he was pretty pretty spot on. Moving on to the FA Cup then, an almost kind of forgotten game in that season was the win at Leeds. Um, at the time, they were developing something of a rivalry with yourselves just because of, of how good they'd become and, and were real contenders with yourselves for, for titles and, and European places. I mean, you started that, that game that day at Ellen Road. Um, what, what were your, your memories of that one? Well, I, I, I think I'm right in saying that that same season, we'd lost to Leeds in the league. Um, or we definitely lost to them previous to that game. The last uh, and they give us a, a bit of a run around. I remember them uh, beating us at Anfield because I got dragged off at half time. I remember. <laughs> it's funny how you remember things like that. Yeah. Um, and before the away game in the cup, again, it seems like old Stevie stories, but Tomo had said to Stevie, um, had asked him whether Dakor was going to run him ragged again, um, <laughs> which which was. Red right to a bull, wasn't it, in some respects? And uh, again, if you watch the game back, Stevie hits that core early on with a tackle. Uh, I think he had to go off injured as well, if I remember, or he was hobbling around. And uh, they lost their playmaker, it unsettled them, and that just set the tempo. I think Heskey played well that day as well, he caused them all sorts of problems. But uh, yeah, we, we had a point to prove, and we, we played really well that day. Um, yeah, I think I think I think you're right. It is forgotten a little bit that game, one of Heskey's best. But but Stevie's tackle early on in the core was another moment in the game that people forget that actually gave everyone a you know they mean business today. Yeah, and then uh, Tramia the Rovers uh, also in that cup run a uh, derby with a difference if you like. I mean, remember that being a surprisingly feisty one. Um, what, what are your memories of that one? Surprisingly feisty. Well, I mean, they never did. We had not, we had not expected anything else. We weren't. It was one of those preparations which we knew the pitch, the way it was, 
yeah. um, was going to be difficult. The long throws. We picked the team and we chatted about it. Obviously, Sammy and myself um, were pushing the pond, Gerard. We need to go English. This is a proper right. English cup tie. When Gerard named the team, there was definitely a British angle to it. You know, and it was, you know, most of us guys, the guys that, that, that were picked that day were very much aware of what it was like to go and play at Tranmere. We knew the ground, we'd seen it, we'd seen, you know, upsets there. You know, they, they were, Tranmere were known, not necessarily, but they had a good record of causing some upsets and obviously been over the river as well. So it's, it was a big game. And, but it was a British core to the team that day. And for, for the opening, say, 15, 20 minutes, I, would, I, I can remember it being, there was a, it was a bit of physicality around. And that, that probably paid dividends because the British players are more accustomed to starting cup ties like, like that. So I think, obviously, Stevie played Danny, Michael. Uh, Robbie played, did he? Uh, I think Danny Murphy must have played then as well. Yeah. So yeah, there was a, I think there was seven or eight of us, wasn't he? But the manager was there was chopping and changing the team at that time. It just obviously chopped it and changed it as as Tom was mentioned there with it being you know a local derby. And I think it was one of those games that you you know you're confident you're going to win, but it was nice to get it out the way really because you didn't want that type of uh, banana skin. And then the uh, obviously the final in Cardiff, people kind of remember it as the Michael Owen final if you like. I mean, how, how do you? Do you remember that one? I mean, I, I watched it recently, actually, and um, it's always kind of put across that Arsenal dominated on the day, but what you, there were quite a few chances for yourselves as well. I mean, what, what do you remember of the 2001 FA Cup final? Well, we'd, uh, we'd beaten Arsenal that season 4-0 yeah. at Anfield. I think we'd ran them really close for a second position in the league, challenging United, and I thought we thought it'd be an even game, but... I thought Vieira that day. What was Vieira looking like? Looking back on the video, because it just felt in the game he was he was a monster in that game. Uh, played really well. So it's maybe a game I need to yeah. you look back at. We always look back at Istanbul, but maybe that's one I need to look back at. But I think sometimes when in the back of your head you haven't played well, but you've won, you always want to forget the game. You just think we got the cup. You know, I don't want to watch it too much again. But yeah. obviously seeing the goals back and uh, some of those moments and scenes when. Certainly when we got the winning goal in uh, Cardiff, and that was a new generation of Liverpool supporters, you know, a decade after we, you know, or a decade since we'd, you know, been successful, really, the late 90s, early 90s with our FA Cup in 92. So it was, uh, yeah, it, 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 it was great, and I, I love Cardiff. We had some great days there. My job on the afternoon was, was stopping Ashley Cole. I was playing on the right side. Um, Gary Mack had been brought in. Um, to play sorry hold on let me start that again i'm just trying to think of the team so gary mack did play no gary mack sorry gary mack didn't play I, I i'd been playing leading up to that game and, and scored a couple of goals so obviously if you were asking me prior to the game with, with the two cup finals coming up you know the fa cup and the uefa cup final which one i'd like to play in i think as a british player you know me growing up as a young boy watching the games coming from been pictured up to Scotland from Wembley. There was always a fascination of wanting to play in an FA Cup final, but when Gerard named the team, I, obviously I was a senior player, I, I couldn't react. It, it showed disappointment, so the fact was that I was on the bench. Let me, let me go back. So, my job for the afternoon was to stop Ashley Cole. I played on the right, Stevie and Diddy played in the middle, and I think Smyser played on the left, and Gary Mack came on later. Um, so my job is to try and identify him and stop him, and um, that's that's quite a difficult task on a boiling hot day, let me tell you. But uh, they they were a good side and they kept possession well, and we we grew into the game a little bit. But we we hung on, we hung on and showed that resilience that we've done on many many other occasions. Um, but I think we forgot to free ourselves and go and play the stuff we knew we could play. We were too worried about stopping them, but. As the game grew on and the, the subs were made and the quality we had off the bench and again the attitude and Michael doing what he do. I mean, Michael's a big game player. I mean, I know there's been a lot of contention the fact that he went to United, but when you actually look back on what Michael did in the Liverpool shirt for a few seasons, he was a phenomenal player and turned turned up in the big games, really did. And ultimately won the game. And that, and that's 
if you look back at finals in history and, and the best teams, usually one or two players pull them through when they're in the mire. And that's what happened that day. You know, we weren't we were in the mire and Michael pulled us through with his brilliance. Um a bit like Stevie and Istanbul, if you like. The the pass from um from Patrick Berger. Remember somebody who was either in the commentary box or one of the pundits said he lumped it out of defence. You have a look at Patrick Berger. He uses that wonderful left foot yeah. and he like bends it round like that, cutting out sort of two players and Michael's onto it. And he gets it in there. And if there, was, if there, was, there wasn't that much, the width of a ball to get it in that far post from Michael's inside left position, inside there, it was astonishing. And the left footed, he drills it across. Mate. It was yeah. bedlam. Bedlam at that point. And uh, it was it's just one. I remember pictures from behind the goal. And there's an old fella, and he's got his hands on the set. I think he's got glasses on. And he's like that as though, what has just happened? And it is, if you see the picture, it's just people went mental. Absolute yeah. mental. It was, I think it was that elation from the sort of game that it had been. And it was to win it. And the celebrations on the pitch were just, were just wonderful. And we'd had it with the, um, the League Cup. But that's, you know, the League Cup. This was the FA Cup, which is, as, a, as a, an Englishman, mm. this is massive. This was so special. And you could see Michael's name going up in lights. This would be his final. You know, and the, to see the Liverpool fans, you know, in the stadium that day was pretty special. But the thing for me was getting pulled to the side prior to picking up the trophy and Gerard just saying, listen, get your head right. You're, you're playing you're playing against Alaves and Dortmund in the week. So disappointment not to be starting. You know, it, all the, the emotions were amazing after winning, but then boosted again by the news that Gerard pulled me and said, get your head ready, you're, you're starting in Dortmund. Yeah. I believe uh, a few years were trying to get uh, dispensation to have a bevy at full time and, and Gerard was having none of it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big dream, isn't it, to win the FA Cup, certainly as an English player. So, yes, there was, a, there was no way we were going to be able to uh, enjoy ourselves that night. We stayed together. In, in Wales that night and then that was uh, he, no he actually said we could have a couple of drinks with our meal uh, sort of like a toast to celebrate yeah. and, and that was right we had a European final three or four mm. days later Gerard made this big speech on the coach and I can remember the lads coming to me and going Phil I just won the FA Cup ask the boss if we can have a bevy <laughs> no it doesn't happen that often and I went to Gerard and I, I said to him obviously being that buffer, if you want. Mm. And I said, Gerard, the lads have asked me to ask, is there any chance of us, um, I've been able to have a drink tonight to celebrate the fact of winning the FA Cup? And he went, Phil, you, we don't often have chances in life to go and win three trophies, he says. And I'm sorry, he says, but no, we can't. He didn't just leave it with me to portray it. He stood up and he made a big speech that this will be done. And when we win on Wednesday, when we win on Wednesday, then we can celebrate. Yeah. And he said, you have to believe in me. We have to be right. Abstain from it. We will have a glass of champagne with, with our meal tonight. And we have to prepare. And that's that's what we did. Um, well, moving on then to, to the UEFA Cup. Before we uh, speak about the final, I just, just want to talk about the clean sheets in, in Rome and, and Barcelona. I mean... For yourself, you know, as I say, a defender's defender and, and someone who, who studies the European game, you must have took huge satisfaction from uh, goalless, you know, clean sheets in, in the Olympico and, and the new Camp. Yes, they were. They were, the, they were the, like the real first big games I'd played away from home in Europe. I'd, I'd played a few games in Europe, of course, but when you, when you think of Europe, you think of sort of those big stadiums. And I think Rome was the first one. Uh, Barca was the semi-final, but we played Rome. And uh, this was the, you know, Capello, who was the manager in European yeah. football at that time. Wherever he went, he won. He won the, or uh, Roma, Roma and, and uh, Capello won the uh, Serie A that season. So we, we were up against the, the best team in Italy. We went there and we won 2 0. 
I think they left Batistuta was their big signing that season yeah. took them to the title. And I think they were that desperate for the title. I don't he didn't play in the first leg. But they still had Montella, Del Vecchio, they had Totti involved. They had, I think, Cafu was up against me as well. Some great defenders. I think Walter Samuel was involved. So they had some uh, top players. But it was one of them where you thought yeah, we'd be put out a real top team there. They were a really yeah. good side. And uh, as I said, they went on to win the uh, the title last season. So it was a it was a big one to come through that. And that and that whole UEFA Cup run was almost like an old fashioned UEFA Cup run or a modern day Champions League run. When you think of the teams we played, you know, Porto were in there, we played Olympiacos, who you associate with Champions League, Roma and uh, Barcelona before we got to the final. For me personally, strangely enough, it was disappointing. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'd always dreamt of playing as a new camp and playing against some of the players I did in that stadium was was an amazing achievement and feeling. But I I struggled with the occasion. I, I didn't play well. Um, I felt a bit too nervous, the, the nervous energy, and I, I was a bit... Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, we didn't have much of the ball, but I, I, I didn't feel like I adapted to the pressure of that very well, and I got subbed. I think a lot of us came off thinking we could have done a bit more rather than elated that we got a nil-nil. And if you recall that Pep, who was playing, did a piece in the hammering us saying that's not football, it's a joke and blah, blah, blah. And then in the in the second leg, obviously, we played better, got the win, the Gary Mack got the pen. and When the penalty was given, all I can remember was Puyol really giving me some Spanish verbals in my ear and really, you know, I was like, wow. I've no idea what you're saying, but it's not very complimentary, I don't think. <laughs> so, on scoring the goal, if you, ever, if you ever get a chance to see the highlights back, my first thought was, where is Puyol? Because I wanted to give him a bit of <laughs> Scottish compliments back. <laughs> and I think Stephen was first to me to congratulate me. So, in that moment of trying to give uh, Puyol some abuse, I think I caught Stephen in the chin with a sort of clenched fist. It was quite. When I look back, it, it did it definitely. It was it was funny watching it back because there was a lot of emotion. It was top quality, and to get two clean sheets against the you know a team like that, I think was something special and something that you look back on. But it was won by an uh, a Gary Mack uh, penalty, and uh, with Pepe in uh, in goal yeah. for Barcelona, young Pepe Reina, uh, Guardiola was involved as well. Got to mention him. So, I mean, it was a typical Barcelona team with great names, really. And uh, the cop that night and, as I said, you know, the atmosphere and us being so strong defensively basically got us through to uh, another European final. Yeah, so you've beaten Roma, Olympiacos, Porto and Barcelona and then you come up against Alaves in the final, which a little bit unheralded at the time, but they did have a great season with, with one or two. I think went to, went, to, went to AC Milan later that summer. But um, once again, you're probably the favourites and... Another crazy game. I, I do you remember that one? It was sensational. It was one of the few games in my time, and probably Gerard's, where you lose control of a football match, even when you're trying to make the substitutions and um, how that. And it, they did have something to do with it. Was, we ripped them apart early on. We raced into a 2 0 lead. Then they changed it. They had three at the back. They then went to four at the back, brought on their striker um, and changed the way they were playing and they crawled the way back into it, went to 2-1, went to 3-1. Oh my God, it was, you know, the second half was a roller coaster. I think when we went 2-0 up, we all thought job done. And you know what it's like in football, you, you, you just drop off a little bit, you just think, you know, you, you don't do the basics as well because you're 2-0 up and then they get a bit of confidence with the goal. Again, the subs did well, came on. I think Robbie came on and scored. Um, and everyone contributed. I, but even when they came back late on, although it could have looked like, a, you know, a, a difficult situation, I never felt a panic on the pitch. I never felt like anybody started doubting themselves. I still felt there was goals in it for us. I still felt we had the upper hand we, in terms of our attacking prowess and the players we had on the pitch. I think collectively we we had some confidence and resilience by that point where the, the, the equaliser didn't throw us. Um, we, we gathered ourselves really well, actually, when we watched the game back. It's, um, I mean, it's, it's a weird game. There's a, 
end to end flow near the end and so or extra time. And then their, their discipline, they lost their discipline. I think they were fatigued. And our and our strength in depth and the bench, the people come off the bench again, contributing. Um and, and Gary Mack's performance has to be talked about. I mean, he was devastated that he didn't play in the final of the court the cup final. I know he came on, but he could have let that affect him. And then he was chosen to play. He played in the middle. Stevie on the right, me on the left. Gaffer messed, um, switched it up a little bit. And Gary Mack's performance on the evening was a. It, it was like his whole career be condensed into into that game with his, you know, his assists, his goal, um, just the level of his performance. It was, say, the Owen final. You could say the Gary Mack final, couldn't you? In some ways, my feeling the way we started the game and the way we opened up. I had a real feeling that we could win four or five. And maybe maybe we we tried to protect our lead a wee bit too much when we should have just went for the, the jugular and, and really, you know, put Alaves to the to the sword. But we, we we sat back a wee bit. They were quite brave in their substitutions. And the the game turned unbelievably quickly. Mm-hmm. And to this day, I would say when you see that golden goal one, there was still quite a few players didn't realise that the game was over. You know, and that is that is a fact. Um, on the very left of our dugout here, right on the touchline, Gary Max going across to take the free kick. I'm I'm getting my penalty takers already sorted. And my list of what I think is the most confident uh, penalty takers. So I'd already because you could only, if they're down to 10, we could only have 10. So you have to sort of take somebody out. So I've got a list of the players and I've taken them out. So I've got my list then of um, the players who are going to take first penalty kicks. The um, and who I took out of the equation, DD a man. <laughs> and I'm sure I still have the piece of paper today of, of, of that. And it was just on a on a small piece of paper like that, a small pitch, and I had all the penalty takers on it. So I, I took Didi out of the equation, which he wasn't very happy about. <laughs> but, lo- <laughs> but lo and behold, when Gary takes and flights the ball in, and he's great trajectory on it, didn't he? And he just whips the ball in. It comes off Jelly said G E L I, I think his name was. Mm-hmm. Comes off him, and goes in the bottom corner. Well, we just shot out of our seats. We're all on the pitch. The lads are all celebrating with Gary Mack and, and everything. And I remember some of the players looking and going, where are you all going? What are you doing? Patrice Beggs, our coach, he's thinking when the staff, we all ran on the pitch, why are we running on the... He'd forgotten it was a golden goal. Two or three of the players, I think one of them was Patrick Berger, had forgotten that it was a golden goal. But it was... It was sensational. Five four, what a game! And uh, the lads were, the lads were tapping you on the shoulder for a bevy after the FA Cup. So they, they must have been dying for one after that one. Oh, they were dying. They were desperate. So by the time we had all the celebrations on the pitch, back in the dressing room, by the time we got back to the hotel, it's two or three o'clock, and we'd had all the food lined up for us. Whatever happened, people needed to eat. So of course we're all in there. The families were all uh, back and uh, at the hotel. But Gerard said no drink. We'll have a glass of champagne to celebrate. But I think it must have been about ten years on. And Didi a man said, "Of course we had a drink." <laughs> As you can imagine, Didi, yeah. Didi had have a, have a drink, he'd have a cigarette, and he'd be sitting there and celebrating. I don't know where he'd done it because we took over the the whole of this uh, hotel. And it was all on one level. So they couldn't go too many places. But Didi said, of course, we had a drink. But we were up and back and preparing for um, Charlton Charles. Mm-hmm. on the Sunday. Yeah. And then obviously the, the parade with the, with the three trophies. Um, in, incredible scenes. Um, did, did you have to tell any of the, of the foreign lads what, what they were about to witness or you know, expect? Or, you know, how do you remember that, that day? Well, no, not for me because it, it was. That was the first for me, so I wasn't too aware. Mm. I'll be totally honest. I, I didn't really want to get too involved. I, I wanted it over with quickly because I wanted to uh, go out and get on the aisle with my mates <laughs> and my family. 
and I'm thinking, oh, the sooner this is done, we can we can get out then. But then when you see the scenes, you're like, you, you want to stay on there all night, and it, and it was unbelievable. It really was, uh, really something special, and only just eclipsed by Istanbul, as as Istanbul eclipses everything, I suppose. But you know that day when we were all on on that bus for the first time, a lot of us young lads, you know, three trophies. I mean. When Liverpool are going to be in a position like that again, when they can have a bus tour and have three trophies on show, it's just, it's a unique season. It's special. I don't think anyone has ever won three cup competitions before in a season. I may be wrong. And I think anywhere, maybe in Europe, it's just unheard of. And it, and that's what made it special. We played every game we could possibly play that season. And again, that's that, that's unique in itself. Mm. And uh, yeah, those, those, that, that, you know, those scenes of, of coming back on the coach, I, I remember that. In the mid '80s, when Everton and Liverpool would come back from cup finals, and you'd, you'd see coaches and people lying in the streets, and that, so to be part of it myself was it really was something special. Oh God, uh, it's it's just it's just school schoolboy dreams, isn't it? If you're a red, what do you want to do when you're a kid? I want to play for Liverpool. You know, I want to win something with Liverpool. I want to score at the cup end. I want to hear my name sung, and I, and. I want to play with my mates and lads who I respect and care about me, who's got each other's back. I want to play for a manager that supports me and supports us, and I want to enjoy everything about it. And that season had it all. I can't think, I mean, there must have probably been one or two times where I was not happy in terms of being left out or whatever. But overall, what, what a year. And actually, not just a year. I mean, a period of a few years, actually, that was... A wonderful environment to play football in because you, we were growing. You know, even the league for you know, we had the fourth, then the third, then the second. Everything was building, everything was growing, and being part of that, especially when you, I don't know, it's hard really to. to there's, a, there's a lot of Liverpool fans who I've spoken to, and you, they ask you the question about what was it like, you know, playing for the team you support. And you know, I used to go to match with my old manager you now, and I don't know. It, it's just an unbelievable, surreal feeling that you, you you're given this opportunity to live that dream. It's 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 there are times where I look back and think, actually, why on earth did you ever on any given day feel miserable at work when you're at Liverpool? Why did you moan about anything? Even if you got dropped and you're on the bench, you're still on the bench for Liverpool, aren't you? You're still playing for the, one of the biggest clubs in the world, the club you love. Shut up, get on with it. I look back and think, why was you, you know, should have enjoyed it more. But you know, it's hardly a negative, is it? Really, just because you couldn't have a good bevy on after the uh, after the final. <laughs> True. Um, well, the man who stopped you from having a bevy then was, was obviously Gerard for a uh, yeah. good reason, of course. Um, I just wanted to end with, with a couple of questions about him. I mean. You've spoke, spoken, you told a couple of stories about your relationship with him over the course of the last 20 minutes or so. I mean, it, it felt like you, you, you had a really good relationship with him. I did. Of course I did. Um, a lot of people have talked about what he was like and um, and made the, made the picture quite clear to people, I think. Um, and hopefully I've done that as well in previous chats. But he had a, a care inside to him like a father figure in many ways. You know, I'm talking about checking on you, how you were, how things were at home, even asking after your kids, your family, remembering their names. You know, every detail you'd ever spoken to him about, he wouldn't forget. Yeah, I'd spoke to him a couple of weeks before he'd, he'd passed and it was, it was devastating. Not expecting it. I didn't know he was mm -hmm. ill again. He hadn't told too many people that he wasn't feeling well. And he was going to have an operation. Um, so the shock of it was just incredible. And I know if if he's had this heart problem and he, he went for his checks on a regular basis, that's why he knew he had this weakness back again um, in the aorta. So I think it, it, it always be in there. But the shock on the morning at it, that it, happened was just devastating and it was funny because i'd had a I, i'd had a voicemail early in the morning from of all people gregory vignal who is working in marseille the football club mm -hmm. and we greg and myself had uh, seen each other in madrid and swapped numbers and he, he texted me 
he'd already done it, but I didn't know because I hadn't looked at my phone. But my son came through the door in the morning about half nine, quarter to ten, and he said, have you heard the news, Dad? And I said, what's what new? And he became, and he went, oh, oh, oh. he didn't want to be the one to tell me. Yeah. And he said, oh, Dad, I don't know how to say this. He says, Gerard's passed away. Oh, it was, it, it was, it was just devastating. Absolutely not knowing that he'd been ill. And it, I couldn't talk until late in the afternoon. People were, were wanting from radio, television, um, from the media, just wanting. And I couldn't speak. I could mm. not speak. It was such a shock. I'm, so I'm not sure how much other players were still in touch with them, to be honest. I don't know. So I don't know what other people's relationship was like with them, but I used to sort of just send them a text every couple of months, really, or he'd send me one just on whatever it may be. But he was a, he was a father figure. He really was. Mm-hmm. He was the one manager in my t- time because of maybe my age and when he came along and the way when he spoke. He's one of those people who, when he spoke, you listened. You know, we've all got that person, two or three people in your life where, you know, you're a little bit wary of them. You want You want to keep them happy. And when they speak, you really listen. And uh, he had that way about him. He was a great communicator. I think that was one of his big strengths as a as a manager. Certainly, his team meetings were, were, were fantastic. Some of the best things I've heard going up before the game. And here's on the back of your neck, standing up, going into these big games. So he, he was great at you know half time as well. So he was in a he was a special man and had a very special way with words. His emotional intelligence was key in knowing when you were feeling crap or down or, you know, lacking confidence or... I'll never forget when I... Uh, I've talked about this before, but it's it's a pivotal moment in that he was really unwell. He'd, he'd had the operation and stuff. And um, we'd played Southampton at home and it's the first game I'd had. I think I got a bit of stick from some of the fans when I got subbed. I think Heskey did as well. I think We drew 1-1, I think. Didn't play well. Got a bit of stick first time and... Um, I was I was I was gutted, you know, as you would be. Of course you would. But uh, Tomo pulled me in on the Monday, and we had United midweek away, uh, which we went on and won, and I scored the goal. But he pulled me in the office, and he had Julio on the phone. And I'm talking about a fragile Gerard. I'm talking about a man unwell, really struggling to speak properly, you know, because I knew him well, and I could tell in his voice. And all he wanted to get out really was that. He, he, you know, he believed in me, stay strong and get ready for Man United was his message. And I just thought to myself, you know, even now saying that and thinking about what it must have took for him to do that and the fact he was even thinking that way um, showed how much he cared for the club and for me personally. But there's probably 10 or 12 stories like that about his, his human side and, and, and the fact that he cared. And I think a lot of other players have told similar stuff as well, maybe that things that hadn't been heard before. So I'm very thankful to Gerard. I'm very, very grateful I got to work with him. I got to be um, friends with him and, and I had a relationship with him, you know, even after um, he left. Um, he's, he's, he was a special man in my life, very inspirational man. And he's, of course, he'll be missed, but he'll never be forgotten, not by me. We had such a great relationship. It was it was wonderful. It was a it was a coming together of two people who were, who were different ways. I was the the angry, the narc who was necessary at the time, which for him to develop needed me to take on the players to change a little bit. And I played the game. I played the game uh, gratefully to get yeah. a chance to come to get a chance to come back was a great experience to learn from them to become best mates. Um, to value him, to trust him. The trust in each other was just... And he was such a good man. For, for supporters of my generation, they, they kind of grew up listening to tales from, from the dads or the granddads about Liverpool teams past and, and what they won. And uh, this team was the, the first one who kind of showed them what it was like to actually you know, witness it and, and you know, go to these games. So um, I always remember that from, from Gerard Houllier. But how, how do you sum up his legacy at the football club? Because I've heard it said a few times that you almost dragged the club into the 21st century, you know, kicking and screaming. 
yeah, I think that's spot on. I just think he got Liverpool back on the European map. That's the big thing I think of. I think of being the you know when we went into the Champions League for the first time and got to the quarterfinals, and very few teams ever did that in that day and age when they first went into the Champions League. I think United and Arsenal struggled notoriously for years getting out the group stage, and for us to uh, win the UEFA Cup, then get to a quarter final of the Champions League the following season as well, it was just like you know winning the Super Cup as well against Bayern Munich. That was a big thing for Gerard. It really was, and th that's what I think he did. He got us back competing, and. He got us back to being not seen as a soft touch. Liverpool became a or became seen as a soft touch. Now we almost went. People would argue maybe too far the other way, where we lacked a little bit of the football that we see from maybe the teams of the past or the team that we're watching right now. But we were very strong physically. We were a big team, tall, good set piece wise. Very strong mentally in tough moments and in big games against Everton United, we could always come through and win those games. And big cup games, semi-finals and finals, we we always managed to get across the line. We, we were like the grinders, really. You know, we would grind our way to wins rather than you know play teams off the park. And uh, that 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 group and that season is still my favourite season. It really is, and and they're the players that still count as me, me best mate, shall I say. In mm. football, really, and it, I mean, as I said before, it's difficult to eclipse Istanbul with anything. But in terms of enjoyment, not an ever beat that season because we were basically just winning every game we were playing in. Really, cup games every week felt like there was a cup game every week. You know, whether it was the midweek with Europe or the Carlin Cup, or then the weekends the FA Cup. But it just it felt like we were just playing games constantly. We were getting great results and. And that's what that made that season so special and so uh, so uh, rememberable. I, I, I spoke to Stevie about this in an interview last year regarding the platform Gerard created, the training ground, the discipline, the professionalism, sports science, all those things. I don't think it's easy to say in a one line what his legacy will be, but I mean, he definitely for those Liverpool supporters who understand the club and go far, you know, that far back in terms of remembering. He definitely set the foundation and the building blocks for Rafa, uh, for Brendan, for Jürgen to, 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 to keep moving the club forward. Um, because that was the hardest bit from where we were. We were we were well behind Arsenal and United, as you know. And someone had to come in and do that. And he did it with a, a mixture of an iron fist and a, and a big heart. Um, so, yeah, I think he'll be remembered fondly. I mean, everyone's got different memories, haven't they? For you know, depending on your age and what you what you remember as a fan, but his legacy will be a hard-working, intelligent, lovely man who cared about Liverpool Football Club and who who will be remembered because he got some success and he and he he brought the fans on board with that for the majority of it, didn't he? Gerard always said to me, he said, Phil, if you get back into the game, just after we finish that Liverpool. You have to think back and what you left, what your legacy is at a football club. What have you done? He said, what we did, we brought a brand new state-of-the-art training complex to this football club for Rafa Benitez to walk into. He said, we brought a height of discipline back into the football club, which helps you progress the way that you should. And we brought trophies, which is the most important thing. He said that is our legacy uh, to Liverpool Football Club. And, it, and he was quite right. And I like to think he should be revered by the fans for, for what he did. As we want to put smiles back on the fans' faces, we were there to be counted again. And it was all thanks to Gerard Houllier. Because he, he, you have to understand, he changed the culture at that football club, as Wenger did with Arsenal. Julier did to the good of the players and the football club, team, staff. He, he moved us on. No, well, the thing is, it was, I was very fortunate to play under him at Liverpool and, and I owe I him everything. You know, to take a chance on a 35, 36-year-old player at the, end, at, the, at the far end of his, his football in life, to give me the opportunity to get to Liverpool, I, I was, I'm always be deeply debted to, to Gerrard. But then, obviously, I went and worked alongside him at Villa. You know, probably get closer to him then than what I did as a player. You have a player-manager relationship, but then when, when I worked with him at Villa, you know, when he's manager and I, I, and I was there to, to assist, 
we spent loads of evenings talking about football and talking about tactics and got to know, you know, we were basically living in the, ho the same hotel together. And then you bond, a, there's a friendship there, you know, so I was his player, I was his assistant and I, and I hopefully, but the biggest thing for me is I was, he was a good friend. And I think that's, you know, when, we're, when we had a little get together at Anfield, that was the big thing, you know, he was a good man and a good friend.